Wow. I have been overwhelmed all morning. And, you know, the staff leading worship was a surprise to me, and it was so fun. And it really is true. I think that there is something spectacular happening in the air of worship. Uh, and I love that I get to worship, I mean, to work with that staff. That staff is amazing. Uh, and they are a great staff for our church. And so I want to share with you some of the things that happened this summer. But before I do that, every fall as we start, one of the privileges that we have as a church is to bless and pray for everyone who is a teacher, administrator, a coach. Uh, and, and we want to do that. So we want to affirm and bless. So if you are a teacher, an administrator, a coach, a volunteer in a classroom, if you're homeschooling your kid, we want you to stand. We want to affirm you. So everyone, stand if that's a part of your business, right? Good for you. Yeah. To the back. So proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay standing. Stay standing. Okay, we want to pray for you. Bless you. Stay standing, teachers. You're not very obedient for being scared. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's pray. Extend a hand of blessing towards them. Father, we are so grateful for these men and women who you've called to the ministry of educating and training, administrating a whole curriculum so that they can grow our students and train them. We're grateful for them. God, would you make them mindful that every day you are smiling on them because of what they do. And as they create lesson plans or administrator, coach, or however they're involved, would you give them a powerful sense that your smile is on them. You are available every day to provide strength and help. What they need in these times. God, we are grateful for what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> So every summer I take a break, which is this great gift that you give me. And I'm going to tell you just a couple things. I went to Texas and I went to Sri Lanka, did a pastor's conference, uh, prayed for you guys. So some highlights. If I ask you just to give me one picture of your summer and you said this was my great place, my happy place, what would be that place? For me, my picture would be the porch on Texas. Lori's family has a house on the Guadalupe River outside of Austin and uh, there. Uh, my whole family was there, my four sons, and then my four daughter-in-laws, which are so much better than my sons, and then, <laughs> and then my four grandkids, which are the best of all. And I know, you know, you get old people and they talk about grandkids, but trust me, it is so much better than you can ever imagine. It's worth sticking with the kids, right? <laughs> and stay close, pay whatever price, because they control the grandkids. So just trust me, remember that lesson. It's the best thing you're going to hear. So. So I got them all in Texas. It was just great. And what I love on the porch is every morning, Lori and I are out there first, and then we're drinking coffee. And every day, you know, they, they stumble out at different times. We get to connect with them. I just love being on the porch. And at Texas, I, I work, Lori, both of us. We spend a huge amount of dollars. I buy a new toy every year. I bought this floating mat, if you've seen them, where you can build, like, pyramids on them. The grandkids ran on it. It's pretty expensive, but it was so worth it because... Did I mention how great grandkids are? So, so I do that. I spend a lot of energy to make sure all the toys are working. And, you know, we just have a great time. But every year, God just, it is amazing. Because that verse in Matthew 11 where Jesus said, if you, as a human broken parent, you ought to give good gifts to your kids. And I do. And I consider it a privilege and I'm happy to do it. How much more does your heavenly father give good gifts to you? So just, I'm startled by the thought that there, are, I have a heavenly father who counts it as a privilege to use his resources to bring good to my life, to make me happy, to invest in me. He loves to expend his energy, protecting, and I get emotional because I get emotional there. But protecting and watching over and delighting and playing with. I am staggered every summer by it. And just reminded, we have a heavenly father who loves us that much. You need to know that. And then secondly, I went to Sri Lanka. I did a pastor's conference there. Pastor Adrian, who you've heard spoken here, he has an incredible ability 
to bring in pastors from Southern Asia. He brought in pastors, huge numbers of pastors from uh, 15 different countries. Here's a map. Uh, and a lot of those countries, I didn't know where they were. Bhutan, I met a bunch of pastors from Bhutan. It's one of those red dots up there. Nepal, probably Bangladesh, you know, Cambodia, you know, Miramar, Mongolia, you know, pastors from all over. It was amazing. And one of the lessons that I learned is that, you know, just the power of showing up. Every morning in a deal, I got the first part of the morning, I got to teach God's word for an hour and a half. I found out I am very good at an hour and a half. So I've been cheating you, so we're going long this morning. <laughs> I, I just want you to know, 90 minutes, it's awesome what God will do. Uh, and I found out I'm funny in every language. So I did. <laughs> even they translate in the group, I'm funny in every language, you know, when they try. But, uh, you know, I went, and really, I don't know their needs, I don't know what the issues are, but I just got to tell you, whatever God asks you to do, if you show up, the distance from your ability to what needs to happen, God will make happen every time. And he did. It's just only God. Um, but God provides. The other thing is, you know, I was, that is the, that is the under-resourced church. When you're with those pastors, every, that's two-thirds of how Christians are. And you are so aware that they don't have anything like what we have. But God provides what they need to take the next step. And I was amazed that even as we gathered the church in Cambodia, got what it needed and encouragement for the church in Laos, Laos, the church in Laos got it, what they needed from the church in Miramar, the church in Miramar was encouraged by the church in Bhutan, I'm just amazing how God does it, but I had a stop you in the tracks moment that I haven't gotten over yet and I don't even know what it means, but during the pastor's conference something happened at India and uh, Pastor Adrian thought it was important for everybody to pray for India and the, the church in India. And so he said, he goes, we need to pray for India. And he goes, and I would like the church, the church pastors of Pakistan that are here to pray for the church in India. Now, if you know anything about their history, Pakistan hates India. And they feel like India has taken things from them, abused them, hurts them. And, and, you know, the pastors are just, you know, they're dutiful people. And there's one guy who is... Uh, Really, the, I don't know why, but he was the most pronounced leader of the churches of Pakistan. He kind of stood up, and he just shook his head no. And Adrian, if you know Adrian, just amazing. He just leaned in, and he said, and, and you, point right to the guy who's going, would you come, and he said his name, would you come and pray as we gather around the church of India? And he's going, and, you know, so he's a pastor, so he's going to stand up. And I think, okay, you know, he's going to give the dutiful, God, we want your gospel to go everywhere in the world and even to the Indians, you know. And so, <clears throat> and so he stands up and he's shaking his head. And this guy began his prayer, and it was a dutiful prayer at first. But, you know, Jesus talks about praying for your enemies, bless those who hurt you, I mean, all that whole thing. And I saw this guy transform, and with tears in his eyes, and it's emotional to me because it was emotional then. And he began to pray a blessing first. Yeah, God bless the church and these pastors because he'd love them. But, and then he went, and God, would you bless India and the leaders of the church in India? And would you do a work in India? And he went off and I just, God stopped me with this thought. Kenton, who are you shaking your head when when you see that people group or you think of them because you think they take something from you or they think you think they hurt you or they're different from you or they're less than you, you, you know, your head is shaking when it comes to praying for them. And then he hit me with, and where is my church, Mariner's church, shaking its head and praying and refusing to pray, pray for and love a people group that we think are going to take something from us and going to hurt us. We're so afraid of praying God's blessing on them. And I haven't, I haven't been able to get over it. And I think that God wants to talk to us about that. And I don't even know what it means. But I can't get over it. It was a powerful moment. Then there are other things that happen. Uh, the whole 
there's a global team summit and there's a leadership meeting tonight. Lots of you that are leaders are invited to it. You'll get to hear some more about that. But you'll get to hear in future weeks other things that, that happen. But we had a great time. Uh, and then, of course, I get to be away and Lori and I get to be, I prayed for you, prayed for our church, planned this whole next year. Very excited about this next year. And uh, I, you know, it's no surprise as I spend time with Lori that, you know, I would love her more. I just think she's awesome. No surprise there because she's wonderful. But the surprise is that she likes me and loves me. <laughs> See, that's good to know, you know, because that's not an easy job. So very excited about that. But I am excited to be back. I'm excited about our series. So if you've got a Bible, pull it out. If you've got an outline, I want you to look at it because we're in a series. You make the call. And I'll tell you why I love this, because this is a series that you have the extraordinary opportunity to invite your friends, your co-workers, the people that you work with. Just as a reminder, you know, people show up at church because they were invited. The reason you're in church is because somebody invited you. People don't just show up. And so, you know, this is your extraordinary opportunity, because what we're going to do is we're going to look at God's word together and we're going to see how you get wisdom and insight, God's truth, for these defining moments where you have to make a decision. And not just those, but those moments in life that are in between moments when you don't have a big decision to make and there doesn't seem like anything you can do. What do you do in these in between moments? What do you do also in challenging moments, discouraging moments? How do you and where do you find the help that you need? And so I'd encourage you, you know, it's a great time to invite your friend. And you got to see last week, Kyle started the series. And by the way, did we have great teachers? You had Kyle, Mike, Steve, Bianca. I mean, you had, there was a whole lot of great teaching this, son, this uh, summer. But he talked about what's the best question. So the most, you know, the best question that you can ask when you're making a decision is what is the, I was looking for wise, everybody say it. What is the wise thing for me to do? What's not the right thing because that gets too limiting, not what's legal, what can I get away with? But the best question that you can ask in light of my past experiences, in light of my present situation, in light of my future hopes and dreams, what is the bet, what's the wise thing for me to do? So we're looking at the book of Proverbs as we begin this year because Proverbs is a book of wisdom written by a father. Think about that. Ten years ago, my youngest son was just going off to college, I'm that old. And we were driving through West Texas. And I've told you before, West Texas is the most boring place in the universe. You drive for eight hours and nothing changes. You think you're in the twilight zone. It's just, you go, how can I be in the same place? I've been going. And it's just, it's like hell. And so, <laughs> and so just as we're driving through West Texas, my youngest son is going off to college literally in three days. He turns to me and says, Dad, I'm going off to college. Do you have any wisdom for me? Oh, eight hours. He's stuck right next to me. So my question is, what would you say? Here's the best news. You have a book in the Bible that's basically written just like that. You have a heavenly father who is there available to you. And when you say, God, I need wisdom. He is there giving you wisdom. It's the book of Proverbs. As a parent, if you're you know, dying for the chance when your parent kids turn to you, because someday they will and they say, do you have any wisdom? The book of Proverbs is the book you want to have memorized. You want to be able to punch it out and say, here it is, your friends, when they're facing a difficult situation in between dramatic moments, whatever it is. Do you have any wisdom for me? Yes, I do. And you've got to have, and that's why I love it. And I hope that the one that we talk about today, you'll memorize. So last week we started off, and this just review, Kyle talked about what it, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That means to not cower in fear, but to respect, to have awe, to put God in the first place. When God is in first place, that's the beginning of knowledge. If God's not in the first place, nothing happens good from there. Secondly, the purpose of the book of Proverbs, these are the goals of your life. The purpose is to teach people wisdom so that you can live disciplined and successful lives to help them to do what is right, just, and fair. They'll give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Man, don't you want that for your students, your kids? Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. 
but those with understanding receive guidance. And you know what the best news is? If you don't know, look at what James 1, 5 says. If any of you lack wisdom, yeah, all you got to do is ask God. Okay, this is it. So what we're going to do, what would you say to your kid if they were talking to you and they said, do you got any wisdom for me? This is the first thing that I said. I mean, I said some other things, but here's the first thing, one of the first things I said. You know, it's all about who you go through life with. So here's something that God's word says. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Proverbs 13, 20. Read it with me. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. With a little more alacrity. Punch it out. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and a wise person in the, in the book of Proverbs is someone who understands how life works, the way things are, understands relationships, understands morality, understands uh, business, understands just like how life works. A fool is a person who knows the difference between right and wrong and doesn't care. A wise person who understands how life works and then lives that way. Now, he says, walk with the wise and become, associate with fools and... He does not say if you associate with fools, you become a fool. He says if you associate with fools, you, it hurts. Now, you don't have to be a Bible person. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to believe anything in the Bible. And you know that's true, right? Oh, we could walk around and we can interview. And if I knew your story... We could find out. I told my son, who was there, I, I told him a story to illustrate this. I said, when I was in high school and I told him the situation, which you don't need to know, but I was with a guy who was a fool and I wasn't doing what he was doing. But when the police showed up, they didn't care that I wasn't doing what he was doing. And when my parents came and they had to get me from the back of a police car, they didn't care that I wasn't doing what he, no one cared that I wasn't doing what he was doing. But I learned when you associate with fools, you get in trouble. And all of you could tell that story, right? Oh, look at me like it's not true. Oh, you could talk about how you ended up in detention. Some of you could talk about how you ended up in the hospital. Some of you could tell very painful stories because you married a fool. And in tears, you would talk about how they destroyed your life. They made decisions and they hurt your family, your kids. I mean, devastated you. Some of you were raised by a fool. It's left school scars in your life. Others of you went into business with a fool. And it hurt you and you lost lots of money. And some of you that are single right now are dating a fool. Yeah, I know. And, and you're going, but he's so good looking and she's so pretty. It might be worth it. <laughs> Associate with the fool and... So here's the lesson. People that you do life with impact the direction of your life. That's just it. People that you do life with impact the direction of your life. Every one of us has a season in our life. Every person here, you could define a season, something that you wish you could undo, that you could erase, that you could have a do-over. You know, that <laughs> spring break, your freshman year in college, that business deal, you know, first three years of marriage, whatever it is, you've got a season in your life, and you know what? You didn't do it with an enemy. You did it with a friend. Somebody who you thought you loved? Somebody who you thought loved you? I mean, you did it with people that in your life. So the people that you choose to do life with will impact the direction of your life. And do you know what? That truth isn't just the truth for junior high students or high school students or college students. That's a truth for you. Truth for me. I mean, it just is true. And so if you walk with the wise, you become wise. Now I'm just going to tell you as a parenthesis, I'm going to brag about our church. The best thing that we do as a church is to connect people in life groups. We spend more money than any church I know in America to get you, your children, and your students 
into groups. And here's why. People do not grow in rows. I know, that's profound. You should write that down. People <laughs> do not, we'll write that in the bathroom for you. People do not grow in rows. They grow in circles, spiritually speaking. Now, I love rows. I give my whole life to teaching people in rows. That's where you are now. But that's not really where spiritual transformation takes place. It happens in circles. And I got to tell you, parents, and I know lots of you watch online. And watching online is a great thing. When I'm gone, I watch online. You know, there's a great, and we have, I'm surprised how many people watch online. But for those of you that are watching online and parents, there is no substitute. For getting your children and your kids here because what we do is we get them in circles. We get them in life groups. And our goal is to partner with you to anchor deep into your students' lives. God's word, God's faithfulness, theology, powerful truths of faith. So that when the storms of life come, they have an anchor that will hold them. We want to partner with you in that. And there is no substitute, watching the line script, but there's no substitute to being in circles with people. And I want to tell you, those of you that work volunteering in children's or in the youth ministries and wherever it is that you help us get people in circles, you do the most important ministry. Thank you. We got a leadership meeting tonight you've been invited to. And my whole goal is to just say thank you to you because of what you do. So we'll talk more about that. So, you know, and I know you're busy and lots of you go and I got no time and, you know, everything. But, you know, so that's, you know, I want to help you get into that. So uh, in my drive, we're driving to Texas, I'm driving through Texas, driving home. My son says, what's the, you know, the wisest thing? And I'm, so I said, you know, I quote, walk with the wise, become wise. Associate with fools, you get in trouble. And I asked him because I know, I said, you know, as you look through your junior high and high school years, you look back, what's one of the best things in your life? My son, when he was in sixth grade, got a part of a small a life group, eight other guys. I'll just be honest because it's just us. The leader, I thought, he's not the best and brightest. And I almost thought, you know, I'm the pastor. I'm going to go in there and get my kid in a different group, which would have been the biggest mistake of my life. Because this guy was awesome, and I couldn't see it. But he got an eight in sixth grade. So just those of you that have sixth graders, I'm telling you, the best thing you could do is march over to the junior high and go, Who, how do I get my kid in one of those groups? He says, you know, my son got involved with six other, eight other, there were eight guy, boys. And they went all the way through junior high with the same leader, and he went on into high school. Like eight years, he walked with them. That guy was faithful. He would call them every week. He would be there whether they, they were, were there or not. Every time they got together, they would talk about God's word, junior high level or high school level, appropriate truths, where he walked through life. He goes, you know, as I think about it, the decisions that I made, fast forward, those eight guys were all in each other's weddings. I mean, they still are doing life together. They started in junior high. He goes, you know, one of the best things I ever did. I guess was get in that small group of a bunch of guys going the right direction. Because when I look at my life, my son said, where I ended up, it's a lot because of those guys. You walk with the wise, you become wise. You associate with fools. Your life spins apart. You get hurt. And so he told him. And I said to him, I said, you know what? The same thing's true. His whole life, he's watched me be in a life group. And he's modeled where, you know, I do it. And, so, you know, he gets it. It's a part of our life. So it's the best thing. Junior high, high school parents, we are so committed. You know, your kids over there, if they're, that's what we're doing. It's the best thing that we do. So uh, now I know some of you are sitting here and going, that's so sweet. That's nice. And you know what? That's great. But... I'm, you know, I'm too busy for that. This year's got, I got a lot of things going on. I just don't have time to be in a small group. And, you know, I don't do the sharing thing. You know, I just don't need that. And, so, and I don't like the structure. You know, the way I connect with God, I like coming on Sunday morning. I don't need the structure. So let's just talk about that. What do you do in your life that's not structured? You don't structure your business. You just go, eh, I don't like that. I just do what I feel. You structure your business. You structure your marriage. You structure you, how you eat. Your di you know, you discipline yourself and exercise, all that stuff. You've got to structure yourself for spiritual growth. And so, the, you know, the uh, wise thing to do 
you know, is to build a team. We're talking about building a team of wise people. And the most foolish thing that you can do is be around foolish people that will hurt the direction of your life. So I have one goal today. I'm just going to tell you what it is. My goal for you who have not done Rooted, which is this 10-week experience. It's a freeway into a life group. I'm trying to get you who have not yet done Rooted to join Rooted. For those of you that are in a life group but you haven't yet started, I'm saying get started, let's go. And for those of you who your life group blew up for whatever reason, I want you to get into life group connections. Okay, do you understand? So my goal. So I'm going to be charming and whimsical, then I'm going to punch you in the face because I love you that much, right? So what are the wise people? What's a great team to build your life? Say wise. What's the team you want to build your team full of? And the thing you don't want to do is build your life around fools, right? You don't do it. So I want to talk uh, with the group of people uh, that I think are most resistant to getting into a life group. Now, this is from 30 years of experience of being your pastor. And I know it's a little stereotypical, but, I'm, you know, I'm an expert at these things. So I want to talk to, so what's the one group of people that are here that are most resistant to getting into a life group. Guys, men, all right? So I'm talking, it's not that I don't value you, you gals, but you seem to do this well. So I'm talking to you guys, all right? Guys, because for whatever reason, I'm talking to single guys, to married guys, to engaged guys, to young guys, to 40, 50, 60, 70, you know, whatever. I'm talking to all guys. Now I want to talk to you guys because we have a tendency to drift towards being isolated, autonomous, and independent. And I've thought about it this week, and the reason is, is, you know, if you talk to a guy, would, you know, everybody kind of, their dream, a guy's dream is, I'd like to build a business, sell it for a billion dollars, so I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want. I want to own a fleet of cars, you know, I want, I mean, just whatever it is, because that's kind of what, now I understand that, because part of it is the thumbprint that God's put on your life. We all have a desire to accomplish great things, to go out and slay dragons, to find God's purpose. But in our brokenness, we compare with each other and we compete with each other and we have this broken desire to be independent and autonomous. And even worse, we want to isolate. And the best way to isolate, guys, is through... Okay, since you didn't know the answer, let this burn into your heart. Anger. Okay, anger is the best way to get some distance. And so the way we isolate is we just pump a little anger and resentment and we start thinking, you know what, uh, the problem with my unhappiness is my wife or my job or my kids or my car. But you know that's not the problem because you married her and you chose it and you raised them and you bought it. All right? And it's not that you're unhappy with them. The problem is that you're unhappy with... That's right, because you're comparing and competing against that dream, and you want to be independent. You want to be bulletproof. You want to be isolated. You want to be by yourself. Do whatever I want, whatever I want, with whomever I want. And it's not good for you, okay? And so we do that. We isolate, guys. It just We tend to drift towards that. And then you got stuff going in in your heart and you don't want to share because you don't want to share what's inside and what you've done, you know, because that's dangerous. And so you use the word busy. You know, I'm just busy. I got stuff to do, all right? See, I'm not as fun anymore, am I? All right? So this is the punch you in the face time. So the, and so you go, I'm just busy. I'm just busy. And you know what? It doesn't work. And, and single guys. Can I talk to you for a second? You got stuff that you need to work on if you're single. And you need, and you can't wait until marriage because it's going to be way too painful. You need some people in your life that are going to look at you and say, dude, don't do that. <laughs> and the problem is, is if you're single and somebody annoys you, your roommate annoys you, or you got a friend that bugs you or you don't like somebody, what do you do? Move on. And in marriage, that's not the way it works. And so you need to have, you need some people that are going to speak the truth to you. You know, what's the most powerful thing? You know this. What, after three years of marriage, what does everybody say to a married guy usually, generally? Wow, you're way nicer. 
Why? Because you're accountable now, and she's beating you up because it's not good for man to be alone. So you need some help. So single guys, too. So look at what it says to, you know, this whole idea of independence as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. That's not going to work for you to be independent, to be autonomous. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for time of adversity. You don't get that by just being your own person. Anxiety, uh, uh, anxiety weighs a heart down, but a kind word cheers it up. You've got to be in community. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, it says. So today, my goal for the group that is most resistant, guys, is to encourage you to make the most courageous choice as you begin the fall, and that's get in a life group. Get in a place where you're accessible, you're accountable, that keeps you from drifting towards, you know, something that will destroy your life. That's my goal. So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a very hard-hitting story. It's a story that you know. Uh, very familiar. You don't even have to be a Bible person and you know this story. It's been made, movies have been made out of this story. So if you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. And I want you to turn there because there's one verse that I want you to mark specifically because this is the haymaker. And if I can't get you with this one, I just can't get you. So here it is in the one verse that I want you to look at. But I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to read part of it. I'm going to tell you the story to get you to the point real quick. All right. One evening, verse 2 of chapter 11. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of his palace. Now, David, at this point, is 50 years old. He has been king of Israel for 20 years. He's not a college kid running around looking for a girl. He's married. He's married actually a few times. He's got a few wives. So he's, he's 50 years old. He's written Psalm 23. He's a man after God's own heart. This is a good guy. But I want you to see what happens. David got up from his bed, walked around the roof of his palace, 50 years old. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone, a slave, to find out about her. The man said she is Bathsheba, Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam. Eliam, that means David knows her because Bathsheba's grandfather is one of David's trusted counselors. That's why that is punched out. And then it says the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was a close friend of David. He is one of David's mighty men. When no one else stuck close to David, there were a group of guys that stood with David, was a friend, fought next to David, risked his life for David. This is a friend of David. He knows this person. He, knows, he goes, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. And this is Kenton in the white spaces, but I don't think this just happened one time. I think he called her the next night and the next night and the next night, and it went on. And the reason is because in verse 5 it says, the woman Bathsheba conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And he does not say, how do you know it's mine? Because it's gone on long enough that there's no question. And so what does David do? He does what all guys do. He says, I'm going to control the outcomes. All right, no problem. I'm going to control it, which is insane because he thinks it's a secret. But who, he sent a servant. Do servants keep secrets? <laughs> Good point. No, why? There's no, there's no incentive. So everybody, you know, you hear what David's doing. You hear what's going on. It happened night over. So it's out everywhere. But David thinks he can control the outcome. So he sends for Uriah, who's a powerful warrior, a general in his army. Gives him back, says, tell me how the battle's going. Uriah's confused. He's saying, why don't you just ask a messenger? You don't bring generals back to find out how the army's going. So, you know, but they talk. And so David says, hey, okay, nice to hear it. Hey, in the morning, you go back, you know, but tonight go see your wife, wink, wink. Well, he doesn't because his people that, you know, the people he commands are at the battlefield. He's, so he spends the night with those people whose responsibility it is to protect the palace. David finds out the next morning, he's frustrated with Uriah, calls him, he goes, why didn't you go back, see your wife? Hey, the guys that work for me, that serve under me, they're in battle, harm's way. I can't do that. So David has him come over that night, tries to get him drunk. Hey, go see your wife. Still doesn't do it because Uriah is a better man than David. So David doesn't know what to do, so he 
writes a message and literally gives it to Uriah because he knows he's such a good guy, he won't read it. And he says to his, the commander, Joab, of his army, Joab, put Uriah at the very front of the battle and in the heat of the battle when it's most intense, pull back so Uriah dies. And he does it. And David thinks, job done. Controlled the outcomes. I've got it done. And the illusion of that is foolish because there's only one kind of control that God wants you to have, and that is self-control you don't get to have any other kind of control but David thinks got it outcomes control but there are huge tragedies because even though he's perpetuating a lie his adult children know what's going on they're going come on dad because Bathsheba mourns for a period of time but then David marries her and they're like really dad you expect us to believe this you already have some wives but you're going to act like you know, this is just the way it went. Come on. And so David lies to his family and he sacrifices something. He never gets back because he does it and then lies to his kids. He lies to his, you know, to his generals and they all know what happens. He lies to the people that are closest to him. And he loses something he'll never get back. Outcomes, control, right? They're not. So look at what it says in chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Why does he send Nathan? Because Nathan's a prophet and he doesn't work for the king. Because who's going to speak to the king? All the people who has a voice in the king's life are out the battle. Nobody can talk to him. So God has to send a prophet to him. And he says, when he came to him, he said there were two men. And what I love, I'll just tell you the story. It's just, he comes to him and he says, David, I got a problem. Can you help me with this problem? There is this very rich man who has huge herds, lots of cows and sheep. A huge family and right next door is a very poor man who has a small family and he has one lamb and it's a family pet the rich man had a friend show up from out of town unexpected and he had to throw a dinner for him and so instead of going out and slaughtering one of his cattle or sheep he went next door and took the family pet and he killed it and fed it to his friend look at what David says David's burned with anger against the man see anger Ooh, isolation and he said to him as surely as the lord lives that man who did this must die did he deserve to die no he shouldn't have done it and there should be some penalty but not die and then nathan said to david and this is one of the verses in the bible you gotta love read it with me you are the man this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorite. Nathan is saying to him, you know why God sent me? Because there's no one else in your life that, you're, that, you, that you listen to. You are inaccessible. You are alone, you are autonomous, and you are independent. Now, you know the rest of the story. David confesses in a beautiful way, which is one of the reasons why David is called a man after God's own heart. And I don't have time to go into it, but I don't want to in any way minimize the wonder of God's grace, that God is a forgiving God, and when we turn to him, he forgives and we step in. And at the same time, God never removes the consequences. And the reason God does not remove the consequences is because... None of us would ever turn to God if we got away with everything. And we would go to hell, literally, because we wouldn't understand the pain of sin. Consequences, the pain of sin, and the consequences are huge. The child that David and Bathsheba had dies. David's family rebels. The story is as hideous as any you will read in the Bible. You know the Bible's true because you find about a son and what he does. And it's, you can't believe it's in the Bible. You should read. It's amazing. And David loses things he'll never get back because of that. Now, why did I read you the story? Because the one verse I want you to underline is chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring... In the spring, in the time when the crops come in, when everybody's harvested their fields, when young men now can go to war. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. It was said that's what kings did. That's what David did. They go off to war. David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, but David remained in Jerusalem. David, at the age of 50, decided to be isolated. <clears throat> 
autonomous and independent from the only group of people that could hold him accountable. His mighty men, the people who came up with him, the people who knew him, the people who walked with him for 20 years, that understood his strengths, that understood his weaknesses. He separated himself from the only shot at anybody who would hold him accountable for his life. Because he says, hey, war is for the little people. War is for the small people. I don't do that anymore. I'm a king. I don't need the structure. I don't need to be around small. I don't need it. I don't need rooted. Oh, did I just punch you with that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't need to be in a life group. I don't need to be someplace where I'm accountable. I can be by myself. Guys, you need it or you will pay. And you guys are the group most resistant. I know why. I get it. But guys, what's the wisest thing you can do as we begin the fall? All you had to do was say rooted right there. You'd be my eighth student. What's the wisest? There's three answers. Rooted, get started, or rejoin, okay? And so it's, what's the wisest thing you can do if you've never done rooted is rooted. Wise thing if you're in a life group Get started, let's go. And the wisest thing, if your life group busted out, there's a whole thing that's life group reconnection that we do because people don't grow in rows. People do not grow in rows. And we're doing everything we can to help you get where you need to get to. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to ask you one last question. What do you want this next year? What do you dream about? What do you dream about for your family, for your marriage, with your kids, in your business, and in your own personal life? What is it that you want? Because I'm going to tell you, the best thing you can do to get whatever that answer is, get in a life group, be accountable, be connected, be in God's loving community. God doesn't only want to connect with you through Jesus, his son. He wants you to connect with the family of God. It's the place that you grow, and it's where you get what you need. Whatever it is that you want, I'm telling you, the road is community, but it's your call. Father, would you speak to us? And remind us again right now of how much you love us. You want to connect with us. But you want us to connect with your family, the place that we experience in tangible ways. Your love, your grace, your kindness. Because your family is your extension. We together are the body of Christ. God, would you create a holy discontent for those who are disconnected here today. Would you, through your spirit, Make them understand how great your love is for them and their, your great gift to them is the people sitting around them right now. People who will walk through life, who will love them. God, would you speak to us even now as we worship? Drive this truth deep into our hearts. Let's stand together. Let's sing and worship the Lord like we have all morning.